thank you. Thank you for your very kind introduction um, and for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, four of the ICH Q3 guidelines, so Q3A, B, C and D. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleague Andrew Teasdale, um, who was due to be giving this presentation with us, but has been called into a different meeting at the moment, unfortunately. Um, but my thank you to Andrew for um, largely preparing the slides that I'm going to present today. Um, so if we begin with consideration of the ICH Q3A and B guidances, these are the guidances which refer to um, setting specification limits um, and controlling the levels of impurities in the case of Q3A in drug substance and in Q3B in drug product. Uh, so this next slide shows uh, a decision tree which can be found in both of those sets of guidance. Um, and what teams can do, what companies can do, is work through the decision tree with regard to individual impurity levels. Um, starting at the top, you consider whether the impurity is greater than the ID threshold. If it is, you then have to consider whether you know what the structure of the impurity is. If that structure tells you that there may be human relevant risks, then you need to reduce those to a safe level. Um, if you don't know if there are any known human relevant risks, then you consider whether it's at a level greater than the qualification threshold. Um, if it isn't, then you take no action. If it is, then you will need to reduce that material to the qualification threshold. Um, and if you can't do that, then you need to consider further tests such as genotox studies, um, whether that material needs further tox studies to qualify it at the levels which have been seen, um, and any other as appropriate specific tox endpoints. And following that, you will then decide whether there are any clinically relevant adverse effects. If there are not, then the impurity is qualified and it's safe to proceed with your human studies. Um, if there are adverse effects, then you need to re reduce the levels of that impurity to acceptable levels. Um, but as I say, this decision tree can be found in both the Q3A for substance and Q3B for product guidances. A couple of general points on impurities. Um, so Q3 A and B specifies thresholds for when impurities are reported, when they are identified and when they are qualified. And qualification is a process of acquiring and evaluating data that establishes a biological safety for an individual impurity or impurity profile at level specified. Um, so levels of impurities present in any safety or clinical studies are considered qualified up to the levels that were in the batch that was tested. Um, and you can also consider uh, whether impurities which are significant animal or human metabolites have also been qualified because essentially these metabolites were part of the dose um, shortly after administration to the subject. Drug substance impurities must be qualified in preclinical studies before we can take that material into humans. So there are a standard battery of tests that are used. These are typically carried out on a batch of API. Um, so we're then testing what a safe level of API is to start our clinical studies with. Um, this is covered by the ICH S2 guidance, which relates to drug substance. So the risk assessment for humans is based on preclinical studies. And when we've done those tox tests, those, those studies, preclinical studies on the API, that will also include any contribution to the profile, the toxicity profile, which resulted from the presence of the impurities at the levels which have been tested in that batch. From the ICH guidance for a drug dose to up to two grams per day to a human, the threshold for qualification for a new impurity is 0.15% or one milligram per day, and whichever is lower of those two numbers. Um, it's worth noting these are based on lifetime limits. So there's an assumption in the guidance that the patient will be dosed for 70 years with the material. Now, what this means is that during clinical studies, where we know the, the study may be for short duration, those ICH limits are not necessarily appropriate during drug development. Um, and the way companies deal with this is likely to be different from one company to another, but we will talk more about that in some later slides. This is lifted from the guidance, so these are um, from attachment one in Q3A, the drug substance guidance, with the thresholds for reporting, for identification and for qualification of a new impurity. Um, and there is a, a distinction between drugs which are dosed at less than or equal to two grams per day and drugs which are dosed at greater than two grams per day. And as I said previously, we have a qualification threshold of 0.15% or one milligram per day. We also have an identification threshold of 0.10% or one milligram per day. And as I said on the previous slide, the guidance is really designed for um, commercialization for marketed products. 
for the identification threshold also applies in the ICHM7 guidance. So this identification threshold should still be applied in clinical studies and determine whether we um, subject impurities to QSAR analysis as part of a risk assessment for mutagenic impurities as well. So this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I'll talk through it. Um, what this slide is trying to show, if we start down the left-hand side of box one, is that we will typically carry out a preclinical safety study, for example, a 28-day rat study, um, using a batch of drug substance, which is used in these enabling talk studies. Now, if, for example, in this batch of substance that's gone into a 28-day rat study, which was dosed at 100 milligrams per, kilo, per kilogram per day, we had an impurity, which we'll call X, present at 0.1%. What that then means in box two is that we have qualified that impurity X at a level of 0.1% of 100 milligrams per kg per day. So that is equivalent to 0.1 milligrams per, per kg. So impurity X has been qualified in that study at a level of 0.1 milligrams per kg. When we then move on through clinical development and we're going into our first um, human doses, we may be using a different batch of API and this may have a different level of impurity X. So we know we're going into this study with a maximum human dose of 100 milligrams per day. This is equivalent to two milligrams per kg per day, assuming a 50 kilo body weight, um, which is the, the typical level of the typical assumption we make under ICH guidance. And we also know in our new clinical batch that we have impurity X present at 0.3%. So initially you may think this impurity is not qualified because it's at a higher level in the batch than the batch that was used in the TOC study. However, um, as we then work through the maths in box four, to be administered at maximum levels of impurity X in the clinical trial with the new batch, we have to take the 0.3%, which is present in the batch, times the two milligrams per kilo per day, which we know is the maximum human dose that we will be using. And this calculates out to 0 0.006 milligrams per kg per day. And therefore this batch is also qualified for use in that clinical trial. A quick thought, comment on allometric scaling. So this is where we consider the, um, I guess, the, the size and weight differences between the species that we've used in the top study and the human. Um, what we need to do really is think about what a top study is actually showing. So under Q3A, we're already providing a very conservative approach um, by considering the impurity qualification based on dose and calculating that as a fraction of the no observable adverse effect limit that was determined for the API. Um, so for example, one gram of active would equate to 10 milligrams of 1% impurity. So there's a, a level of conservatism built into the ICH guidance already, which means it's maybe not appropriate to apply firmer um, uh, adjustments like allometric scaling. Any adverse effects seen in the non-clinical studies will most likely have been related to the API and not actually to the impurity. So the true safe dose for a given impurity is much is likely to be much higher. Um, for the API based on the assumption that the impurity is likely to be less active than the, than the API. Although, as we'll show in the next slide, we make an assumption in the Q3 guidance that actually impurity, we, we assume the impurities in a, in a sense are more active than the API and make assumptions for this. And I'll, I'll talk through that in the later, in the next slides. Allometric scaling is referred to in FDA guidance, but only in terms of setting the safe starting dose for the API. So we do consider allometric scaling for the API, but not for impurities. So this slide is a little bit busy. Um, I talked to the relationship between the API and the impurity, no observable effect limits. What we're really trying to show here is we have a dose response curve. So as the dose increases, we reach what we refer to as the point of departure, where the toxicological response starts to increase. So we have this drug substance dose response curve, which is shown with the black dotted line. At the point where the toxicological response starts to increase, that gives us our drug substance, no observable adverse effect limit. Um, and if you consider that we might we might control an impurity to 1% limits, um, effectively what you're moving is, what we're saying is the point of departure for the impurity is at a level 100 fold lower than the point of departure for the API. So our assumed impurity, no observable adverse effect limit is 100% time, is 100 times lower than it would be for the API if we're controlling an impurity to 1%. But what is actually a safe level for impurities? Um, effectively, what's also written into the guidance is that we uh, we can allow up to one milligram per day in, in humans, and this is considered to be a safe dose of an unknown impurity. 
Um, so that's built into the identification threshold and the qualification threshold. Um, so implicitly, there is data indicating, um, unless there is data indicating differently, a lifetime intake of one milligram per day is considered to be safe without further qualification. For a 50 kilo human, this relates to, uh, or effectively converts to 0 0.02 milligrams per kg um, impurity per day. Uh, it's worth noting that toxicologists tend to talk in terms of dose, so mix per kg. Analysts, um, analytical chemists tend to talk in terms of concentrations. In analogy to Q38, impurity qualification methodology, um, and we relate this to animal toxicity, this would mean a no observable adverse effect limit of 0 0.02 mix per kg of an impurity per day for a lifetime. Now, as I said earlier, the ICH limits are determined for uh, marketed for commercial products, not necessarily appropriate during drug development. And as I said, companies may approach this differently, and we'll talk more about this later. This slide is also quite busy, but this relates to some studies by Monroe, um, where they looked at the tox data for 613 different compounds, which they considered to be representative of the world of chemicals, so across all types of chemical structures and different classes. What this study showed, if we start at the bottom left of the graph, um, is that 99.5% of those 613 compounds actually had a no observable effect limit, which was greater than the 0 0.02 mg per kg per day. Um, so 99.5% of those compounds were safer than the assumptions which are built into the guidance. If we extend that and do some further analysis, 95% of the compounds actually had a no observable effect limit which was greater than 0.22 mg per kg per day, so 11-fold higher than the assumption that's gone into the ICH guidance. And further analysis showed that 95% of what are referred to as Kramer class 3 compounds, so what would be considered unusually toxic compounds, 95% of those compounds had a no observable effect limit greater than 0.15 mg per kg, so still 7-fold times higher than the assumption that's built into the ICH guidance. So this shows that the ICH guidance is very conservative in terms of ensuring safety um, for the subjects in our clinical trials. Uh, a, study, a more recent study in 2021 by Graham et al. published the results of an evaluation of 181 starting materials and intermediates, so gathering data from the industry and looking at uh, compounds which are more reflective of the kind of impurities that are likely to be present in our drug substances. And this was done to understand the toxicological risks um, which are generally posed in relation to drug substance synthesis. Overall, intermediates generally had much higher no observable adverse effect limits than the drug substances, um, which indicates that this assumption that a lower NOL should be implied from impurity is very conservative and likely unnecessary. The no observable adverse effect limits established for the intermediates range from between 1 to 1,000 milligrams per kg per day, um, so much higher than the uh, 0 0.02 mg per kg we discussed in the previous slide, and only 3% of the intermediates actually had a no observable adverse effect limit below 10 mg per kg, and none of them actually had a no observable, no observable adverse effect limit below 1 mg per kg, um, so effectively 50 times higher than the assumption that is built into the Q3 guidance. So I'd like to talk now about earlier phase clinical trials. Um, these typically will be carried out with a limited number of patients, these studies will be for a limited duration. Um, patients are normally very closely monitored because it's the first time we're giving the, this new drug substance to the patient. Um, so this then leads to the question from the industry as to whether higher limits could be applied than the lifetime limits that are assumed in ICHQ3 under these scenarios. So reminder, the starting point in ICHQ3 is one milligram per day as a qualification limit shown to be safe representing a negligible risk of harm for lifetime exposure to this unqualified impurity. Early development is not really covered by Q3A, so um, there's then discussion about how we could derive what a safe higher threshold for short-term exposure might be. Um, and this is some work that was published by Harvey et al. back in 2017. What Harvey et al. used in their paper um, was a, a concept called Haber's Law. This is appropriate for extrapolation of different durations of exposure for conditions where the dose rate is not the determining factor and only the total dose dictates the biological or the toxicological effect. Uh, so what this really means is it doesn't sufficiently consider circumstances where the, the hazard or the toxicology might be acute. Um, 
There's therefore a modified form of Haber's law. Uh, so modified Haber's law uses a different equation shown on the right hand side, c cubed times t being equal to c prime cubed times t prime. Um, and as you can see on the graph on the left, for a six month duration, Haber's law would allow us to extrapolate one milligram per day back to 150 milligrams per day um, for a duration of six months or less. Whereas the modified Haber's law uh, extrapolates one milligram per day to five milligrams per day for a duration of six months or less. So the conclusion in the Harvey paper was that for a non-genotoxic impurity, a limit of five milligrams per day is considered to be safe and acceptable for early development clinical trials with durations up to six months. And you can actually use the same um, the same mathematics to work out safe durations for different durations of study. For example, a 12 month study, you could work out um, what an appropriate limit would be, which would be higher than five milligrams per day, for example, uh, sorry, would be lower than five milligrams per day for a 12 month study. <laughs> so as an example, um, I've obviously I've anonymized this. Um, but in a project, for example, uh, a process and a scale change in the chemistry may lead to a new, a new impurity present at a level of 0.3% in the API. And um, this level in the dose that will be used in the clinic will still be less than five milligrams per day. Um, and obviously this new impurity would mean we can't continue to supply the clinical trial if we can't determine that that's a safe limit for that impurity to be dosed to the patients in that study. So the approach taken in this case was to specify the impurity at 0.4% in the drug substance. And this was highlighted as a potential degradation product. Um, so a limit of 0.6% was applied in drug product. Both of these limits um, ensure that the dose would be less than five milligrams of that impurity in the study. The rationale for this was that there was not time in, the re in relation to the clinical program to conduct further safety studies. And um, the study was of a fixed dose and duration. Um, these limits would cover that study for up to three years. And the structure of the impurity had been identified. It was similar to the API. So there were no concerns that it, that it may have been a mutagenic impurity where lower limits would therefore imply, it would therefore apply. So that's Q3A and Q3B. I'd like to move on now and talk about Q3C um, and Q3D. These are the guidelines which uh, refer to control of residual solvents in the case of Q3C and control of elemental impurities or heavy metals in the case of Q3D. Um, we'll start with Q3D. This is a guideline for the control of elemental impurities. Uh, in some ways, it can be viewed as replacing the old heavy metal USP231 test. All marketed products in ICH regions have to be compliant with Q3D, and this has been since December 2017. Um, and in line with the implementation of Q3D, USP231 was retired. 231 was a color metric limit test. Um, it was not specific to different metals and it had a sensitivity limit of around 10 ppm. So there were issues with this um, historical test. And what Q3D introduces is a risk-based approach for the control of elemental impurities in the final product. It focuses on all the potential sources of elemental impurities um, and also in, uh, introduces testing which needs to be specific and sensitive down to limits of around 0.1 ppm. And so orders of magnitude lower than the 10 ppm sensitivity of USP231. Uh, during the late 90s and early 2000s, ICP inductively coupled plasma testing became much more prevalent and available across the industry. Um, and so studies were done um, comparing USP231 with ICP methods. And as you can see in the graph on the right from this paper, uh, the USP test gives much lower recoveries typically, typically than the ICP um, approach to the analysis of these different individual elemental impurities. So USP231 is non-selective and shown to be quite significantly inferior to ICP in these spiking studies. Q3D guidance totals 73 pages. Um, however, the main body of the guideline, including the references and the glossary, is only within the first 17. Um, the rest of the guidance takes the form of a number of appendices, uh, with appendix one being about the method for establishing exposure limits, so how the, the numbers which are reported in Q3D were determined. Appendix two, established permitted daily exposure limits, PDEs, um, for different routes of administration. Appendix three is individual safety assessments for the 24 elements discussed in the guidance. And then appendix four is some illustrative examples. The guideline is applicable to both synthetically derived products, typically small molecules and biologic products. 
um, reflecting the fact that the guideline relates to a holistic assessment of potential sources of elemental impurities, many of which can come from water and process equi equipment and potentially addressed through GMP, and which aren't necessarily specific to small molecule drug synthesis. Gene and cell-based therapies are excluded, as are herbal products, radiopharmaceuticals, vaccines, cell metabolites, DNA products, whole blood, and a range of blood derivatives. So there are a number of exclusions to the guidance. Um, so how do we identify potential elemental impurity? This is done through uh, a drug sub, uh, sorry, a full drug product risk analysis, um, represented on this slide by what we refer to as a fishbone diagram. Um, so this has all of the contributing um, factors coming into the full risk assessment for the drug product. These include the drug substance, and will include considerations like whether any metal catalysts have been used in the chemistry, any inorganic reagents used in the later stages of the synthesis. Similarly, for the excipients coming into the drug product, have any metal catalysts been used in their synthesis? Are any of these um, excipients mined materials, so dug out of the ground, or based on plant-based excipients? And we'll discuss later with an excipient database that can be used to look at typical levels of elemental impurities in, in these materials. We also consider the manufacturing equipment, what utilities have been used in the, the production facility, for example, water quality. Uh, and then finally, the container closure system for the product. So is it a liquid formulation in contact with, with materials that might leach um, elemental impurities? Are there any metals in the packaging components? Elements are classified into different classes. So class one contains four elemental impurities, arsenic, mercury, cadmium, and lead. Um, these are identified based on the toxicity and lack of general use in manufacturing processes and their high natural abundance. Um, specific reference is made in this class to the potential risk of presence in excipients which have been mined, so dug out of the ground. Um, what's required in terms of assessing the risk for what's sometimes called the big four is often misinterpreted. The guideline states that we have to do a, a, a thorough risk assessment um, for the risk posed by these four elements. Irrespective of the route of administration, what the guideline does not say is that we have to test for these four. So a thorough risk assessment that shows that there is no risk of these elements being present should be enough um, to justify not testing for these, these elemental impurities in our product. Class 2 is broken down into two subsections. Um, it's actually divided into class 2A which includes elements considered to present a risk based on their relatively high natural abundance. And um, this includes cobalt, nickel, and vanadium. And class 2B relates to elements that are generally considered to be of low natural abundance. And um, so this includes elements like silver, gold, palladium, platinum, uh, thallium, etc. And these are typically only considered if they've been deliberately added to the manufacturing process. Um, for example, as a, uh, as a catalyst in the chemistry that's been used by palladium or platinum um, or the other metals there. And then finally, class three elements are considered to be of very low oral toxicity. So risk assessment is only required when these are potentially present um, for other routes of administration like inhalation um, or by parenteral administration. This includes barium, chromium, copper, lithium, lignum, antimony and tin. So using the approach limits were established for 24 elements in total in the guidance. And the individual assessments, as I said earlier, are described in Appendix 3. And Appendix 2 describes the actual limits which have been set for the oral, parental, parenteral and inhalation routes of administration. One of the more recent updates to the guidance, and um, this is going back a couple of years now, uh, was inclusion of a different route of administration. So setting limits for cutaneous um, administration um, and some revisions in terms of the uh, the PDEs. The quality, the, this, this was not in the original guidance because the quality of the data relating to dermal exposure was not good enough to establish individual acceptable intakes. Um, so what's now been introduced is a concept of a modifying factor. So this cutaneous modifying factor is based on absorption through the skin of any, element, any elemental impurity that might be present um, in the product. Uh, so PDE for elemental impurities with the exception of thallium and arsenic, uh, we apply a parenteral PDE or a cutaneous modifying factor of 10. So the limit is 10 times higher than the parenteral PDE um, for the elements other than thallium and arsenic. For arsenic, we apply um, a cutaneous modification factor of two. Uh, so specifically for arsenic, this takes us from 15 micrograms per day as a permitted daily exposure to 30 micrograms per day. Um, for cutaneous 
um, exposure. And then for thallium, uh, we keep the same limit. So the conversion factor is one. So eight micrograms per day for parenteral is um, the limit is also used uh, for dermal um, absorption. Cutaneous and transcutaneous limits uh, for nickel and cobalt. Uh, so the cutaneous, transcutaneous limit in addition to the PD is warranted for nickel and cobalt to reduce the likelihood of eliciting skin reactions um, in patients who may already be sensitized to these elements. So a dermal concentration limit of 0.1 microgram uh, per, per square centimeter per week is applied to set this limit. Um, so an application of a 0.5 gram dose to a skin surface area of 250 uh, square centimeters. Um, and recent reports suggested show uh, recent reports showed that cobalt showed a very similar to nickel, so that limit has been set in the same way. So this develops a new appendix for limits of elemental impurities by cutaneous and transcutaneous route. It does not apply to drug products intended for mucosal administration, uh, for ophthalmic use, for rectal or subcutaneous and subdermal routes of administration. So only to cutaneous um, and subcutaneous, uh, transcutaneous, pardon me, routes. Um, it's established the cutaneous PDE permitted daily exposure for all of the elemental impurities um, for systemic toxicity, and it's established the separately the cutaneous transcutaneous limit for nickel and cobalt for sensitized patients. Uh, so the total nickel or cobalt level is at or below the cutaneous PDE, and the respective concentrations do not exceed um, for both of these put together the CTCL. Uh, other updates to the Q3D guidance have been um, some corrections of the PDs for silver and for gold and nickel, which were incorrect due to a calculation or transcription error in the original guidance. So the expert working group re-evaluated relevant data and concluded revised PDEs of silver and revised a modifying factor for gold and a rounding um, approach to nickel. So the revised PDE for silver by the parental route is now identified as 15 milligrams per day. Revised PDE for gold by the oral, parenteral or inhalation routes now identified as 300, 300 or 3 milligrams per day respectively. And the revised PDE of nickel by inhalation is identified as 6 milligrams per day. So go back to the risk assessment process. We identify, and um, so this is reviewing the API, excipient, manufacturing process and container systems. We evaluate. So we collect predicted and or observed levels of the elemental impurities and the different um, risk factors and compare data with the established permitted daily exposure numbers. And then we summarize control. So we summarize and document the risk assessment. We identify any additional control requirements that may be, may be necessary um, to ensure that the PDE is met for the individual elemental impurity limits. The guideline provides a useful framework that we can use for conducting the initial stage of the risk assessment, as illustrated in the fishbone, de fishbone diagram we discussed previously. Uh, and as, as we said when we went through that fishbone, we need to consider each of these components. So the risk assessment has to, con has to include consideration of substance, of excipients, of manufacturing equipment, um, of the utilities used in the production facilities and of the container, con the container closure system. So some of the other factors to be considered for drug substance, these include processing aids um, and other organic materials. These are unlikely to contain significant levels of elemental impurities. Water, if it's of a good quality USP grade, is out of scope. Solvents generally do not utilize metals deliberately in their manufacture, and many solvents are purified by distillation, which is likely to remove any elemental impurities. There's little evidence of contamination from primary container closures. Um, um, and low level metals in those materials. And this would require a solid to solid contamination mechanism, which is, is not a clear way for uh, contamination of a solid drug substance to take place from, um, from its uh, container closure system, from its packaging. And um, so actually the main significant risk of uh, elemental impurity contamination in drug substance synthesis primarily comes from the, use, the deliberate use of metal catalysts in the synthetic chemistry used to make the drug. Looking at excipients, this was considered by many to be the most likely source of risk, um, as excipients come in a range of different forms. Mined excipients in particular were considered to be the most likely to contain elemental impurities at ele elevated levels. So these include things like talcum powder, um, excipients which may be synthesized with a catalyst like mannitol, excipients of plant origin like cellulose derivatives, 
acceptance of animal origin like lactose and gelatin um, and then of lower risk uh, excipients which may be synthesized without the use of a catalyst like colloidal silica and so with mind excipients being considered as the, the most likely to have a risk of containing elemental impurities. So work by Butzel et al, um, this was published back in 2021, um, investigated the use of an excipient database um, which allowed companies or um, projects to now go away and look at this database and determine what the typical levels of an elemental impurity across a whole range of different excipients were. This demonstrated that using the database in conjunction with other sources of information gives a credible source of elemental impurity levels um, excuse me, as part of a risk assessment and is a really valuable source of information for, for carrying out that drug product risk assessment process. The collection of data helps to reduce the burden of analytical testing for elemental impurities and excipients as well. So this, is a, this was a cross-industry publication. The database gathers um, information that was collected from across a number of companies uh, from excipient analysis that had been carried out by a range of companies um, and pulls all that data together to form a credible database of typical elemental impurity limits in different types of excipient. So in terms of conclusion, Q3D was introduced to harmonise the assessment of risk of elemental impurities. It replaces the outdated permacopeal appeal test with a much more modern and highly sensitive technique and also introduced a more holistic approach focusing on control of elemental impurities in the final product. Um, in reality, what we've found since the introduction of the guidance is the risk associated with excipients has turned out to be much lower than was originally feared. Um, so we are seeing much lower elemental impurity levels in, in the excipients, including the mind excipients, than was expected. So finally, I'd like to talk about the ICHQ3C guidance for control of solvent impurities. The aim of the guideline is to define the levels of main solvents that patients can be exposed to um, with a reasonable certainty that they would not be compromising their safety. And to express that exposure in the context of residual solvent limits in the pharmaceutical product. Safety is the guiding principle, so the key expression is of the amount of a particular solvent that a patient can be exposed to daily. It's usually converted into a concentration um, for a fixed daily dose of a product. And this is to provide, provide consistency with the way that the analytical chemists like to um, like to talk um, and report their, their findings. The scope of the guideline encompasses residual solvents and substance, excipients and products formulated from, from the substance and the excipients. Um, <coughs> what the guidance gives is tables of uh, PDEs uh, for different solvents, um, which companies can then control their products to. But what about new solvents? So what we are seeing increasingly in the pharmaceutical industry is use of green solvents because of their reduced impact on the environment, um, cost effectiveness, and because they may be less, less toxic to patients who may be exposed to them in the products, and also to the, our workers, to our staff who may be exposed to these solvents in production occupationally. The guideline for residual solvents recommends acceptable amounts um, reported as permitted daily exposures for solvents and covers more than 50 commonly used ones. However, these new green solvents were not necessarily covered by the guideline. So a recent revision has introduced limits for three new solvents. <coughs> These are 2-methyl THF, which has a, a PDE of 50 milligrams per day reported, um, cyclopentyl methyl ether, CPME, with a PDE of 50 milligrams per day, and tertiary butyl alcohol, uh, which is being increasingly used in the industry, with a PDE of 35 milligrams per day. With regards to residual solvent analysis, there are different options. Um, these begin with loss on drying, which is a very easy and cheap technique. It's easily transferable to different laboratories, but it is, however, non-specific, um, so it doesn't tell you which solvent is present. If only class three solvents, so the least toxic solvents are present, a non-specific method such as loss on drying may be appropriate if it's been properly validated. Um, but you know, companies should consider the impact of the solvent boiling point in the test. Um, and that needs to be considered when carrying out the method validation. The next technique is NMR. This is a very quick technique for multiple solvents. It does not require analytical standards of the individual solvents, but it is, however, expensive. It's not typically found in quality assurance labs, and there is some scope for signal overlap between different solvents in this test as well. 
And then finally, gas chromatography is an easy technique. It's cheaper than NMR, but not cheaper than loss on drying. It is easily transferable um, to uh, competent QA laboratories, and it is specific. Um, the only real drawback with gas chromatography is that you do require standards of the individual solvents that are being tested for. So we talked earlier with the Q3A and Q3B guidance about um, exceeding PDE limits based on less than lifetime dosing. <coughs> um, and the ICHM7 guidance for mutagenic impurities also talks about less than lifetime approaches where the daily intake increases with shorter duration studies. However, this, this, is, um, this is being applied to a single and well-studied toxicological endpoint. With solvents, we're talking about PDEs, permitted daily exposures, um, and a number of things need to be considered. These are fixed and should not be adjusted for duration. Um, multiple tox endpoints are used in deriving a PDE, so the data can or you know, should be examined in each case. So is the tox endpoint driven, for example, by Cmax um, or area under the curve? What shape is the dose response curve? What's the type and severity of the toxicity from that solvent? And patient population can be considered, for example, ICHS9 patients with uh, limited life expectancy versus healthy adults in an early phase one study. The duration of treatment may be considered, so is it a chronic daily treatment versus a less than lifetime um, treatment as well. So it is possible for companies to provide justifications that would exceed for exceeding the PDE. This may be acceptable, but it will be on a case by case basis and we need a strong justification. So as an example, um, for this, again, I've anonymized this product, but in the case of this specific acute treatment, a dose of up to 30 grams um, was expected to be applied. Um, and this is for a patient <coughs> with a life-threatening condition. However, the team determined that this dose of 30 grams could expose patients to elemental impurities exceeding the PDE. Um, so PDE shown in the table for cadmium, lead, arsenic, mercury, and nickel were 5, 5, 15, 30, and 200. And the 30 gram dose potentially could exceed these limits by two times, by two folds. So, um, for example, for cadmium, by up to 10 micrograms per day <coughs> versus a PDE of five. The project in this case prepared a justification based on the facts <coughs> or the observations that the patient exposure would only be for three days maximum. And there was data, toxicological data available, that showed that for up to three days, the higher exposures would provide a negligible safety risk to these patients. The 30 gram exposure is only for an emergency care situation, excuse me, where a negligible safety risk was far exceeded by the risk of the life threatening condition. Um, so this was a risk benefit approach to justify slightly higher or twofold higher exposure limits to these elemental impurities in the case of this study. So that concludes my talk for today. I'd like to thank you very much for your very kind attention. Um, Andrew and I would also like to acknowledge our colleagues both within AZ and externally who've helped um, construct uh, this presentation and build into a lot of the work that was presented here. Um, I think if it's appropriate, we have a few minutes, and I'd, I'd be very happy to try and take any questions that you may have. So thank you very much.